actually show it to people. And mm -hmm. so. All right, I think we're getting started. We've got the quorum. Good afternoon. I want to welcome you to a briefing by the Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe. And I'm glad that we're having this conversation today, um, but frankly, we could have been having this conversation about 500 years ago with the advent of the printing press, or maybe 100 or so years ago with the telephone, or cassette tapes in 1979 in Iran, or fax machines in 1989 in Tiananmen Square. Um, you know, we're at a point in history where we have game-changing technology. Um, and it's a game changer definitely in the way that we do business, the way we socialize, and the way that we get information. Um, and we certainly believe that there's a role for the U.S. to play in making sure that the Internet is as free as possible, in particular for those who live in countries that are highly restrictive in other areas of their lives. <coughs> uh, the chairman of this commission, Representative Chris Smith, has been at the forefront of the fight on this issue and is working on new legislation to address these current um, threats. And we know that the Internet has played a role in both successful and unsuccessful popular protests in recent years. Um, but I want to go back a few years um, to 1997, and there was a study by the RAND Corporation that I thought was particularly topical for the, our discussion today, and that is that looking specifically at the question of communication and democracy. Um, the RAND study looks at what is called the dictator's dilemma, and specifically how much communication can be allowed before we reach the tipping point toward democracy. Um, but I'm not going to answer that question right now. <laughs> I'm going to let our panelists weigh in first, and, um, and hopefully through our discussion today, which will include some questions from the audience, so you can be thinking about that while we're talking, um, that we can maybe reach some conclusions on that question. Um, we've put the bios of the speakers over here on the, on the table, so I won't go into those. But we're going to start first with Robert Guerra, who's from Freedom House. Uh, no, I'm sorry. We said we'd start with Kathleen Reen. I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll start with Kathleen Reen from Internews. Then we'll go to Robert Garrett from Freedom House, and then Rebecca McKinnon uh, with the New America Foundation. Okay. Kathleen, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Shelley, uh, to Congressman Smith and uh, to the Helsinki Commission for giving us uh, the opportunity today to share um, our experiences and learning. When Shelley first asked us to talk about this issue today, uh, she was reflecting particularly on events uh, subsequent and in the wake and the continuing story of what is happening in the Middle East and some of the lessons that have been learned and bringing us up to date onto, the, onto these questions. So building on 500, 100 years ago and in the last 60, 90 and 120 days, some extraordinary changes uh, in global communications and lessons learned uh, for those in civil society, in government, activists, dissidents, everyone who uses the internet or who uses a mobile phone. We believe in an open, accessible, unfettered and affordable internet for everyone. And if only everyone else believed the same thing and if only it were that way. Unfortunately, it isn't. There are more than 1.9 billion people in the world who get regular access to the internet today. And there are two real critical issues uh, in addition to those who get that access. There are those who don't receive it at all, and there are those who, when they do, um, are in danger as they access it or cannot ex access unfettered information. There are four ways in which we recommend and seek to ensure that that access is built and promoted across the Middle East and everywhere where censorship is at its most acute. The first is to encourage what we call tool development. The use and promotion of technology is absolutely critical to increasing access to the internet, particularly a censored internet. The continued investment in those tools is absolutely vital. We believe that there is no silver bullet, that there must be a continuing growth and availability of international tools and locally available tools that are constantly adapted to keep up with what we know and call the cat and mouse game in censorship and in access. We believe in education and outreach. A phenomenal number of people around the world today and perhaps in this room don't understand how their internet works, how their mobile phone works and just how vulnerable they are as evidenced by what has happened in various countries in the Middle East in recent weeks and months. 
This is an issue that is not particular to the Middle East, but to everyone and every citizen in the world today. We believe that digital safety and digital security and appropriate investments in those are absolutely essential to ensuring that citizens everywhere are safe and can safely consume, create and share information. We believe that R&D, research and development, is an absolutely vital and important piece of staying ahead of censors and authoritarian regimes who continue to crack down on the internet. Without that investment, we will lose and citizens around the world will have access to less information over time. A particular area of that investment needs to be in mobile technologies. Every day, more and more people around the world are getting access to mobile, and for most citizens in the world, mobile is, in fact, their key form of communication. Most people do not have access to a laptop or a desktop, and most people don't have access to internet cafes either. It is the mobile phone, and increasingly the smartphone, that is the tool of choice and the tool of access, and perhaps in some cases the tool of endangerment for those who are accessing the internet. This is a growing field. It's a new area in terms of accessing and using circumvention tools or building technologies and making them humanly available and accessible. It's growing rapidly and it needs additional and more support. Until now, there probably has not been enough investment to ensure that that growth and that those issues are being dealt with adequately. And we strongly believe that more needs to take place in that space in order for that to happen. As an umbrella set of issues to ensure that more people have free and unfettered access to the internet, I wanted to ref reflect uh, very briefly on what's been happening in the Middle East. First of all, one of the lessons we've learned is that network security, that the very structures that people use and the technology that is used to, to actually build it is vital. It has to be open, it has to be safe, and it has to be secure. So it, a safe and accessible telecoms environment that is kept open at all times is very important. We believe that enhancing security is essential. Many networks around the world aren't as secure as they should be right now, and it's individuals and organisations, particularly at the civil society level, who are the most vulnerable. Education and training for them and stronger networks at an ISP level and at a structural level is essential. We also believe that supporting the fundamental freedoms of the internet and access to information must be considered going forward. For that to happen, a truly global, open and free internet has to be built and it involves truly multidisciplinary, intersectional work. It involves the work of governments and civil society activists and actors and organisations. It involves national security departments and elements around the same table solving the complex problems of how to build a truly open internet. So a legal framework and policies also instituted at the sovereign level are absolutely essential. Thank you. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you. I'd first like to thank uh, Shelley, Representative Smith, and the Helsinki Commission uh, for giving me and my colleagues an opportunity to brief you on um, of our thoughts on um, that could be helpful going forward. Um, and very briefly talk about um, some of the work related to internet freedom that, that I and my colleagues do at Freedom House. Uh, we've recently put out a report on the state of internet freedom. Uh, we work on technology support for activists uh, on the ground um, and actually work around issues related to, to policy. Um, I think what's important to recognize before we get into kind of the issues of the Middle East and when we're talking about internet freedom is, well, what is it exactly? Uh, we need to have some sort of definition, and I would say that in any um, issues that um, the administration or Congress is a strong definition of Internet freedom is key. Um, we take a kind of generalist approach and just want to have a conversation so we could think about it in terms of techniques that are used to control and censor the Internet. Um, we could think about the main threats to Internet and digital media freedom, and we could talk about positive and negative trends. Um, and trying to assess that in some way. Um, without getting into the, the details of our Internet Freedom Report, the way Freedom House uh, looks at it in our analysis is, what are the obstacles to access? Um, so how available is the Internet, mobile phones in different parts of the world, and how complicated or how costly it is? 
uh, what are the limits being placed for people to be able to use that um, technology to create content, and what are the violations of user rights? And that's that's a framework. Other people have slightly different ones. Um, uh, in the report that we did, our highest ranking top three countries was Estonia, the U.S., and Germany, uh, and the bottom three were Cuba, Burma, and Iran. Um, but getting into the issue of, of civic activism um, and some trends and some recommendations for the folks here is to recognize that the use of technology for activism is not something particularly new. Um, if we just go back, you know, 50, 50 years, um, Samistad in the Soviet Union, posting of notes everywhere and sharing it between people um, is a modern version of Facebook, except the intermediary or people's homes was the piece of paper. Um, in parts of the world where the internet is not very developed, there's a term that may not be familiar to some of you called sneaker nets, uh, which is basically people with sneakers go from house to house uh, to share USB drives and content. Um, the most common um, quoted example is Cuba, but it was, the term was first used in Serbia um, when it was part of the former Yugoslavia and the way people used uh, content. Now it's Facebook, and a lot, a lot of focus is on um, the Middle East right now, one of the first examples um, that Facebook w was used for social mobilizing was Columbia and the Million Voices Against the FARC um, that um, did a lot to change the, the environment in Colombia. Um, and we have other services such, such, such as microblogging services that were used not only in Tunisia and in Egypt, uh, but also in Mo Moldova. Um, and we also have other technologies where, where aren't necessarily the internet, but are increasingly merged with it, like SMS. And I would say that activism in the past was also traditional media, like radio uh, and TV, that more relayed a message to people. Um, in terms of repercussions um, and how states are responding, um, you know, this is something that we need to monitor. And increasingly, governments are using general media legislation to try to go um, after organizations and individuals and starting to develop very comprehensive internet-specific legislation um, that will target the use um, and the innovation that can happen. What's very worrisome, and I'll get into more details in a second, is what Freedom House and many others have called technical violence. Um, it's not necessarily going after activists, but going after where their content is, is hosted. Uh, so hacking, <coughs> DDoS attacks, surveillance, cyber espionage, isn't something that's just directed against governments, against the military. Increasingly, NGOs are facing these very same risks. Um, and so to understand this a little bit, let's take a look at, uh, very quickly, kind of the evolution of what I call kind of internet repression. Um, if we go back in terms of, Shelley mentioned, um, uh, efforts by uh, Congressman Smith and others, um, if we go back five or six years, when we were talking about internet repression at the time, or what I call internet repression 1.0, it was really focused on internet censorship. What governments or others were doing to block sites, and that was it. So it was around defining sites that are harmful, creation of software and hardware that were block sites, and that was it. Internet users, um, foundations, governments started supporting the use of the internet, and the activists had the edge. The governments are now reacting, and we're in a stage, um, what I would say is around internet repression 2.0, which is where governments are very actively responding to the great liberating potential of the internet, and they're not just blocking websites. They're being incredibly more sophisticated. Uh, they're using the crowd or users to try to identify content and delete it. They're turning off telecommunications infrastructure, as has been the case, not only in Egypt and Libya, um, but also Burma and Iran. Technical attacks are getting even more sophisticated every day, where targeted malware that we were first seeing uh, in China is also finding its way to Egypt, and DDoS attacks um, are targeting a variety of organizations, um, both in the Middle East and abroad. And censorship has evolved to not just be a whole website, but a particular section of a website, and censorship that only really activates in a particular moment in time when it's more critical, whether it's around elections, as we saw um, in, in the Middle East, um, in Egypt in November and elsewhere, when there's civic mobilization, when there's protests, uh, governments will turn off the internet but leave it on otherwise. Um, 
got some photos which I'll share in terms of how this looks like. Um, but I would say we're now shifting beyond this to something that's even more scary where folks here in, in, in Washington might be able to be helpful is given that governments are getting more sophisticated in blocking and censoring and attacking websites, there's now a whole industry that spawned to support internet repression. So I would say that we've moved on to internet repression 3.0, where now companies want to get into the game. Uh, the list of companies includes both US and foreign companies. I'll go through a couple examples. Gamma International, a UK German company, is most recently been discovered through the raiding by civil society in Egypt of the state security archives of providing technology to the Egyptian government um, that conducts covert surveillance, targeted malware, um, which is very difficult to detect. Not only was there a commercial offer found in the state security archives, but also an eight-month free trial was offered to the Egyptian authorities, and which is this is why a lot of the Egyptian activists found their conversations in the state security archives. And these are activists that are very smart, that had received a lot of training, but when malicious malware is there, it's very hard to detect. We have NARAS, um, which is a California-based company owned by Boeing that develops deep packet inspection technology, which is used for a variety of legal purposes here in the US. Um, but when all the features are turned on in countries where there's no due process, it can be used to conduct real-time interception of email, social network traffic, and report that back to any um, operator that has that. Research, research in Motion, famously uh, the maker of the BlackBerry, is increasingly collaborating um, and, and drafting agreements with countries around the world, including Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, and India, where they're allowing for surveillance of non-corporate communications. Well, activists are not corporate users. They do not have access to the security infrastructure. And so those choices that activists have made to choose the type of technology that they think is more secure, in fact, will not be the case in the months to come. Uh, we can go into Nokia Siemens um, and others. Um, the, Washington, um, the Washington Times recently reported on the issue with Gamma International, where you can see a list of all the um, items. But getting into uh, what hearings and briefings are all about about Congress, well, what is it that can be done? And I hope I'm going to suggest a couple of things and really hope that there's a conversation with my fellow um, speakers here as well as you uh, who are listening, is first Congress must recognize that dissidents are facing far more sophisticated attacks and require far more sophisticated and nuanced support than has been the case in the past. We also must recognize that technology has a human rights impact. And so in certain parts of the world, surveillance equipment and others, when in those hands, will have a, t a terrible impact. And so if we maintain a list of countries that severely repress internet freedom, perhaps companies should report on this in their SEC filings in terms of what that impact is and what is it that we can do. That we must also perhaps in these very repressive countries like China, Vietnam, and others, uh, if there's a certain threshold, um, have a regime of export control. Now, export controls a lot of times are not popular in, in Washington, but I think that something needs to be there to know what the capability of these different countries are. And the question is that technology changes all the time. And so one must try to use technology neutral languages that might encompass not only the threats today, but tomorrow as well. Um, the European Union has, uh, the European Parliament has proposed language uh, and things that they're trying to do at the European level. And their text is that interception technologies and digital transfer services for monitoring mobile phones, text messages, and internet surveillance should be restricted and under export control. We must also encourage, or the US government must also encourage, efforts that bring different stakeholders together to promote human rights and free expression online. Um, there are current efforts um, underway by the Global Network Initiative, and perhaps there might be others um, that bring different communities together. There will be differences of opinion, but having a frank conversation of what the issues are and what companies face is really important. Um, other democracies must also be supporting uh, internet freedom. It must not be the US alone. And uh, so I would encourage efforts of the US Congress to work with their counterparts in other countries where legislators also want to make an impact. 
I'll suggest four countries. Canada, that just had a new election and has a, a parliament likely that will take up the issue. Um, the UK, Sweden, and the Netherlands, the latter two being countries that have actually put money down to support internet freedom. In terms of supporting, um, getting to the point that um, Kellen, Kellen mentioned, is we must recognize that past are the days that only fire but firewall busting technologies were supported. They need to be complemented by other measures, such as training, security, going back to the point that I said that NGOs also face the same cybersecurity issues, yet they have no resources, they have no networks, they have no access to the technical knowledge, and they need to be supported, because otherwise they'll just be inundated and not be able to help. Urgent rep response mechanisms that traditionally uh, the Commission has seen in regards to human rights defenders and activists in the grounds must also be made available to Internet activists, but they need to be tech uh, coupled with technology support. I'll finish in saying that also privacy efforts at home are very important um, because the credential information, which is how one logs into one's social network, one's user account, is the key that unlocks your digital identity but also your digital friendship network. And if that gets exposed, it's not just that your ID has been compromised. It isn't about ID theft. It's about, particularly in many parts of the world, all your friends and colleagues being at risk. And so measures that can be taken to make sure that it's not important to address privacy, that I would say is that privacy should be set by default. If we can't do it at home for whatever reasons, we should, we should make sure that companies that provide these services abroad turn those on in the very repressive countries. Um, I could go on, but I first just would like to thank Shelley for the opportunity and look forward to your questions. Um, and thank you. Thanks. These are really great overviews by the previous two speakers. And so I'm going to try and drill down on a few things um, and, and perhaps address some assumptions that uh, we often make. Both I'm, I come from a journalism background, but also I've noticed that a lot of policy makers make that are, are sometimes proving not to be entirely true and, and that we may be hindered in solving problems by clinging to assumptions that may not necessarily work uh, in the networked environment. Um, and one actually has to do with this dictator's dilemma. Uh, and, and I think in, in the Western world, and particularly in the United States, we assume that all you need is more connectivity. And is, if, if a repressive country gets enough connectivity, uh, freedom will inevitably result. And I think what we're seeing in countries like China, particularly, but also a number of other countries, that is much more complicated than that. That you, it, particularly in China, you have a country of nearly 500 million internet users now. Um, it's yeah, not quite 500, but it's over 450 million at this point. Uh, and. The, the government has managed to adapt to the internet. And uh, I've recently written a paper about this that was uh, published in the latest issue of Journal of Democracy on what I call networked authoritarianism. And it's how China is proving that with enough resources and enough foresight, you know, we don't, you know, forever is, is hard to predict, but at least for the short to medium term, authoritarian regimes can survive the internet much better than anybody ever imagined. I was a journalist in China working for CNN when the internet arrived in China in 1995. Uh, and uh, Warren Christopher, the Secretary of State at the time, came to China and made a speech about how, you know, the, 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 the software of freedom will prevail over the hardware of repression. What, uh, what we didn't expect was that the Chinese government would be able to compel the rewriting of the software and the adjustment of the hardware. Uh, and, and that's what we're seeing happening in China. And then, you know, Bill Clinton famously said, trying to control the internet is like nailing jello to the wall. Well, if you can change the recipe of the jello, uh, uh, control the temperature of the environment and the consist and the porousness of the wall, you might actually succeed. And so, 
this, this is the thing about the Internet. The Internet isn't like air or water. You know, it's just sort of chemically the way it is, no matter what you do, that people, you know, businesses, governments, and users are constantly shaping and changing what it actually is and what people actually can do with it and through it. Uh, and so what we're seeing in China um, is, is that you have a government that has basically turned the private sector because, of course, the Internet, right, is we access it primarily through platforms and services that are owned and operated by private companies or by state-owned monopolies, depending on where you are. Uh, and in a country where the government is able to control the, the infrastructure and strongly regulate all the internet companies operating web services and mobile platforms and so on, uh, basically the government can effectively turn the digital platforms and networks into an extension of state power uh, to the extent that while people feel freer to do a lot more things than they used to be able to do, and in China there's, there's a lot more discourse going on than there was 20, 30 years ago when people are exposing corruption of their local officials and so on, if you try to organize a party uh, to to change the political structure, you go to jail, and everybody who had anything to do with you gets questioned, and that the state is able to do this because it compels the companies that are running the networks and the platforms to cooperate both in censorship and in surveillance. And so one of the things I think that a lot of people in the U.S. Uh, still don't understand um, when we think about censorship in China, we often think about what's known as the Great Firewall of China, and all we need to do is punch enough holes of it in it, and it's going to be Iron Curtain de falling down 2.0. Uh, but what what's actually going on is that you know the blocking of international websites, the blocking of Facebook, the blocking of Twitter, the blocking of VOA and whatever else, that's just the first layer of censorship in China. Um, most of the Chinese internet is run by Chinese companies. It's in Chinese. It's run by companies called Renren and Kaishin and QQ and Baidu and lots of other companies you may never have seen or heard of. But that is the internet that Chinese people know. Uh, and those companies are required to carry out very extensive regimes of censorship. So if you try to organize a group uh, on, the ch on a Chinese social network to support your friend who just got put in jail, your account will get shut down. And there are constant instructions going from the authorities to the uh, companies that run these social networks, platforms, search engines, and so on. Uh, and um, so, so I, I think that, and, and also with surveillance, they're, they're required to hand over information about their users uh, to the government. So this is, of course, one reason why the possible entry into China of Facebook is so controversial. Um, because if Facebook were to go into China and set up a local version of its service, it would be required to hand over user information, and it would be required to censor heavily, and there's no other way it would be permitted to operate in China. Um, so this kind of myth that, that Facebook could uh, play the same role it played in Egypt and Tunisia um, in China if it were to go to China is, is I, th I think, um, you know, based on somebody smoking something really interesting. Um, but uh, to, to broaden it out a bit, um, I'm uh, involved with something called the Global Network Initiative, which uh, the other speakers mentioned. And I think what China highlights is the responsibility of the private sector in determining whether or not this internet that we would like to keep open and free and, and upon which we would like our universally recognized right to be protected and respected, that private companies have an obligation to contribute to the internet, either remaining that way or becoming that way in places where it isn't, or ceasing to be that way. Uh, and that again, this is technology is a lot more political than a, a lot of companies would like to admit. Uh, and so, what we're seeing 
more broadly, I think, is a, you know, a range of trends in a lot of different countries whereby governments are seeking to regulate private networks in a manner, usually uh, the reason being child protection, uh, IP enforcement, uh, you know, fighting crime, fighting terror, but the, the regulations that many governments in a range of countries, including quite a number of democracies, um, the, the measures that are being sought um, push the private networks and operators to take on more and more of a policing function, more and more of a surveilling function, particularly when it comes to child porn and, and IP violations, um, without thinking about how if, if, if you're putting more and more pressure on private networks, even in democracies, to take on these functions, and if there's a certain amount of opacity and lack of accountability in how these functions are carried out, are you really setting up the global internet to potentially be on a slippery slope to being a bit more like China? Uh, in places where democracies are weak, particularly where rule of law is weak, or in a democracy that just happens to have a really bad election where some really unfortunate people get elected and then abuse the lack of accountability in the network to erode people's freedoms. Um, so the point being is that we really need to think carefully and, and which is why I, I like to say that internet freedom begins at home. And I think it's really incumbent on us here in the United States and on all democratic societies to get the balance right, to figure out how do we ensure that we shape the internet, regulate the internet, construct the internet, govern the internet going forward in a way that is maximizes its account, its, its compatibility with democracy, and that does not create structures that will enable sort of unaccountable abuse to be built in or to become more likely. Um, and, and so that, that and, and speaking to activists, um, I'm just going to end on one point and then we can open it up for discussion because I don't want to go too long. Um, but speaking to activists in the Middle East and elsewhere, and, and of course uh, activists, particularly internet activists in the Middle East, um, pay a lot of attention to policy discussions, um, internet policy discussions going on all over the world, including in the United States. And one of the things that people have been saying long before the Arab Spring happened was a concern that uh, legal norms and also technical norms um, being implemented in the West uh, would be, would have increasingly negative repercussions for the way in which repressive regimes are able to use and manipulate technology. And so one of the most, I, I would say, controversial critiques of internet freedom policy here in the West um, came from a Tunisian activist, Sami Ben Garbia, um, who uh, actually ended up playing a very key role, uh, was a very key member of the Tunisian cyber activist community that helped bring down Ben Ali's government. Um, and he, he wrote a very long critique last September um, ab about internet freedom policy from the West and sort of you, you know, with, with the approach that, oh, you know, we, we're just kind of trying to free these oppressed people and not really paying attention to what we're doing in our own homes uh, and that the West needs to get more consistent. Um, and he interviewed, um, interestingly enough, in this blog post, uh, an e e Egyptian activist named Aleh Abdel Fattah, who also played a very prominent role in the Egyptian spring, <laughs> uh, in, in, in the internet activism there. And he asked Aleh, you know, what, what are your concerns? What, what would you like to tell people in the United States and in the West about what they ought to be doing to help you the most? And Aleh said, and I'm going to just read from him here in closing, he said, if people in the West want to support democracy in the Middle East, the best they can do is continue to develop a free, neutral, decentralized internet.
Fight the troubling trends emerging in your own backyards from threats to net neutrality, disregard for users' privacy, draconian copyright and DRM restrictions, to the troubling trends of censorship through courts in Europe, restrictions on anonymous access, and rampant surveillance in the name of combating terrorism or protecting children or fighting hate speech or whatever. You see, these trends give our own regimes great excuses for their own actions. You don't need special programs and projects to help free the internet in the Middle East. Just keep it free, accessible, and affordable on your side, and we'll figure out how to use it, get around restrictions imposed by our governments, and innovate and contribute to the network's growth. Um, and, and so I just kind of want to throw out that little bomb because I, I'm, you know, I'm not because I don't support the U.S. government helping uh, with tools and development, but that there, there's a strong message, I think, coming from a lot of activists in the Middle East that we, we need to be consistent with, with what we're doing across the board. And then just finally, um, I, I would note that, um, uh, again, this, this whole issue of global policy um, by democracies, um, that it's, it's quite important. The international strategy for cyberspace that the administration rolled out on Monday, it's a very high-level document. It's got a lot of great words in it. We'll see what gets implemented. But what's very important about that was that one of my concerns for the past several years has been that while on the side of the State Department and some people on the Hill, there's been great support for internet freedom. You know, there have been other people sort of pushing trade policies, you know, and all very legitimate, necessary interests, you know, trade interests, defense interests, uh, other, other, you know, anti-crime, anti-terror interests, and not that you don't want to pursue those interests, but it, without really giving much thought to how the pursuit of those interests might impact internet freedom and civil liberties on the internet in a negative way. And, and so just complete lack of coordination between different parts of the government on different parts of cyber policy. And what is important about this strategy, I think, is an attempt to say, look, we, we can't be working at cross purposes that we need to pursue these policies with an eye to basic values uh, and make sure that we get it right. And again, we'll see. We'll, we'll, we now get to hold the administration accountable for this. But I, I think it's, it's very helpful in starting a conversation amongst democracies about how do we get the balance right? How do you get these legitimate aims of protecting children and fighting crime and terror and so on, protecting intellectual property, which you need to do? But how do you make sure you don't do it in a way that eliminates due process, you know, violates privacy rampantly and gives regimes, not only authoritarian regimes, but also weak democracies, uh, a chance to abuse their citizens via private networks. And, and we just really need to be careful. So on that, I'll stop. Thanks to all three of you uh, for some really um uh, great comments and, and things to kick off our discussion. I appreciate that. And, and I, w I would like to get to the administration strategy in just a few minutes and talk a little bit more about that um, since it just came out this week. Um, but first, I'd really like to discuss something that, that all of you touched on in one way or the other. Um, and particularly Robert was talking about the 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, how um, basically uh, repression on the internet has evolved over time and the the open net initiative has a great book um, called access controlled um, which the original version was access denied which i think if you go from access denied to access controlled you can kind of see the evolution that they they talk about and how repression has changed and and specific to the topic that we have today is how do we how do we meet the new challenges that are coming about on the internet and um, they do talk about first generation second generation and third generation and it's interesting that um, they, they focus specifically on um, Europe and the former Soviet Union. Um, Rebecca mentioned China, which is always um, a great example of how, you know, China kind of breaks the mold for everything. I think when we, we all thought that, um, you know, free trade would lead to democracy, <laughs> maybe a free internet would lead to democracy, you know, China's kind of broken the, mo the mold on, on, on both of those fronts. And, um, but that's also been the same uh, that we've seen in Russia and in some of the former Soviet states in Central Asia. 
Um, and uh, certainly Central Asia doesn't necessarily have as much of a free internet as we'd see in other parts, but Belarus, Ukraine, um, uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, there's some really good examples of where you do have internet access, but it's extremely controlled. And so I'd like to, the panelists to discuss a little bit about the first, second, and third generations, and then kind of where we are um, with the tools to combat those, and, and maybe some examples or, or some other suggestions on where we need to go. Now, the first generation we normally talk about is the, the straightforward blocking of the internet. And, and we've all seen that there's a number of tools that have already come, uh, come about through funding and, and through innovation in the private sector sector to get around that, but are there other areas on, on the first generation side that we sh could explore, or should be exploring? Um, second generation, um, at least according to the Open Net Initiative, is, is really more um, of a tricky issue, um, and Robert touched on this, is that it's, it's really more the state being very selective about how they control um, not only access, but um, the actual uh, um, physical ability of information to stay up on the internet. Um, and sometimes it's through DDoS attacks, sometimes it's through malware, sometimes it's through um, getting the ISP to actually take down websites uh, for certain periods of time. Um, but it's usually a little bit more sophisticated or at least more, um, uh, more subterfuges involved than just absolutely blocking it and creating a firewall. Um, third generation normally is what they're talking about is uh, looking at the also a little bit more sophisticated view of, let me read this because I'm going to get it wrong. Okay, so it's more of active use of surveillance and data mining as a means to confuse and, attra and entrap opponents. And it also includes um, sort of a, a more of a nationalized view of the cyberspace within the country. Um, you know, so Russia is, you know, viewing the cyberspace of, you know, the RUNET as just the Russian space and that they have control over that um, and expanding the, the powers of state surveillance through those tools. Um, so if, maybe if each of you could just touch on all three of those um, okay. generations and, and what um, suggestions you might have on how, particularly on second and third, because we're seeing that. Um, I think we see all three of them in, in places like China and, and the former Soviet Union, but um, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts. Okay, I, can, oh, I, can, I can go first. I, this one yeah. here. I, think, sure. I think one of the, the challenges is with the more recent generations of repression um, and censorship is that increasingly it's a very ve um, well-developed adversary that is creating huge uh, dossiers that's enlisting the private sector companies um, and using, um, I would say, far more sophisticated cyber weapons such as malware against um, um, users. The problem with malware is that, you know, let's get to that because I'm, I'm saying that it's the most scariest problem is that there's been a series of trainings, there's been a series of support around circumvention tools, getting around blocks. Malware throws is a, what I would say is a paradigm change that's complete because one can have the best, the most secure device, um, take the best precautions, but if an insidious, almost impossible to detect piece of malware is installed on your computer or your cell phone, it will be the electronic spy in your pocket. Um, it will send your geolocation information, it will send your files, uh, we've seen this happening in China, and we've seen this now starting to happen elsewhere. So I think almost, you know, that needs to be nipped in the bud now. Uh, because if we don't, then all the measures and the incredible amounts of funding that are put together not around Internet freedom, but around cybersecurity, will be mute. We'll have to start again. So it's a new weapon that's in the arsenal. Are there tools to fight malware right now? For uh, I mean, the, the problem is that the malware before, they used to be... Um, global in nature, um, and now they're regional, and so the antivirus manufacturers can't get them, and then there are companies that are making them. And so, um, I mean, there are also antivirus software that you think is antivirus, but in fact it's a virus. Um, and so it's, what I would say is, if you want to take a look at it from a strategic point of view, is connecting that community that's following that trend mm -hmm. with the folks that are wanting to help the activists as well, to making sure 
that there is a clearinghouse or some sort of information, what I would say is the technical community. And so the way that the business community and governments and academics have done this is that they have systems in place called CERTs, which are computer emergency response teams, that share information around threats, that communicate with each other, and do training, but also deploy stuff. So that holistic type of approach for the activists or NGOs um, doesn't exist. Um, around, um, you know, if we, that's number three. If we go to number two, I think number two is basically there is surveillance. So it's basically um, activists um, and users, particularly in repressive regimes, need to understand the vulnerabilities and great threats that they face. And what are some very simple measures they can use not, they can decide not to use technology. Um, and that might work. Having, uh, you know, a paper and you burn it, or speaking to a friend. I mean, when people are in the same room, sending an email to each other. I mean, there may be people in this room that may send a text message to each other, which is great, but it's gone to the mobile provider and come back, and you've opened the exposure to a whole variety of different people. And a lot of times, the younger activists forget the older approaches that have worked. Scale is a problem, of course, when you resort to old technologies. But recognizing the risks and, and working with that. Um, one of the great challenges, though, and this is something that, that needs to be recognized, is that it is dual purpose. And so when we're equipping activists to stay smart, to communicate securely, um, it likely will be used by a variety of actors we do not like. But um, we must just calibrate for everything that we do um, there's good and bad, and we just need to make sure that we take great care to make sure that, you know, that, that the benefits. Um, and for, for censorship, I think the issue is that it's not just about blocking. Mm -hmm. And so that governments are changing the way they block. And so if we fund tools, and there's a variety of, you know, great tools that are made by a variety. Um, one of the representatives of the TOR project, I think, was, was here earlier and stepped out. It's a tool that's, that's innovative, not so much in what it does, but in its approach, in that it builds in privacy, it builds in anonymity, and builds in the recognition that it will be blocked and has backup systems for people to be able to access it. So I think the tool developers and those that support them need to recognize that there will be blocks. And so the systems need to be smart. So I would say is tools that have some sort of artificial intelligence then monitor the network and adjust, um, I think is particularly important. But that requires funding, not over a year, not over two years, and it requires not just the technology developers, but the li larger cyberspace community. So maybe those are three different things. And again, they're higher level, and I'm happy to get into more details, but that I think that could be helpful going forward. Just a quick comment to building on the, the question of civic activism and talking about individuals uh, in particular because this is such a massive and broad subject and I think one of the things that we sort of need to think about and distinguish as we talk about it is that there's a lot of concern about censorship and access to information, the ability to share and consume information. At the same time, there's a massive spike and escalation in, in what Robert referred to as technical violence and the environment for civic activists and organisations everywhere and ordinary organisations and well-to-do organisations and NGOs and businesses are increasingly vulnerable to this. We focus on this today when we're talking about civic activists um, uh, throughout not only the United States but everywhere in the world um, because the vulnerabilities of those users are so high and uh, the techniques that we're using, we're finding that, it's, that we very much need to broaden the scope of online anti-filtering tools such as circumvention tools uh, to expand other innovative ways of protecting an, that kind of access. And so um, migration uh, to, to other host sites, particularly for entire sites that are blocked, not sites that are partially blocked, but especially those that are under enduring DDoS attacks, need other specific kinds of help. But that distinguishing is very important for us because when we talk about the three levels, we start finding ourselves in a very deep and complex discussion about the governance of the entire internet and the behaviour of the entire private sector within it, and that includes absolutely everybody. And so I, I think it's very important to sort of focus on what it is that you're trying to bring the resources to and the problems that you're trying to solve. But I think it's worth emphasising a point that Rebecca made, which is that the overall structures, if there is no global agreement, 
if there is no question put to the private sector as they develop tools and think about how those tools are used, if those questions are not asked and those agreements are not brought to the table, it will continue to be an uphill battle, a Sisian feat to try and protect civic activists everywhere. We're just really looking through the wrong end of the telescope. We're looking at the issue the wrong way. If we think that we can solve it activist by activist, when the very structure that people are using is starting to break. Just to add, I mean, hear, hear from everything both of you said. Um, I mean, be, beyond sort of basic circumvention, I, I think what we're hearing and what I will echo is that the solutions are as much human, uh, if not more human, than they are technical. And it has a lot to do with people's awareness and understanding as Kathleen said, of how the internet works, about how their mobile phone works, about what is the relationship between these networks and their government or other governments, uh, and uh, where they fit within that, uh, and what their rights are likely to be and what their threats are likely to be based on their personal situation, and then understanding that the technology is going to change constantly and that people have to adapt. But um, I've seen in a number of countries, um, not just China, but but also in the Middle East, that where people are best at adapting, it's again because there's a community, not just relying on tools that are sent to them by Americans, but there's a community of local programmers and geeks and 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 people who understand the tools, understand how their government is functioning locally. And, and and is and are able to work with people like the Tor project people and and with others to adapt their tactics and also to make requests of the Tor project people or whoever else they're working with you know can you change it you know or could you do something kind of along this lines because nothing we have right now is meeting the threat that we're facing because the threat just changed and and so having communities of people who are not only able to communicate with kind of this global community, um, but also who are able to educate people around them and then kind of create feedback loops of awareness going back and forth is, is absolutely critical because th the situation varies from country to country, even from city to city sometimes in terms of how, you know, the local police department, its relationship with the local carrier in one city might be different than in another, and then the primary threat might be different or, it, you know, any number of things. Um, and and it's, so it's very, very local uh, is, is, is the point. Um, and, and so there's absolutely, you know, kind of no magic app, no one size fits all solution increasingly um, as we move, as Robert said, from, uh, you know, uh, filtering and blocking to, to technical violence, which is increasingly localized and, and developed locally. Um, so, yeah, so a lot of it's about you know, as Kathleen points out, public policy at the top end, but also public education um, as, as much as possible. I'll, I'll maybe add to, to this is, but we also have to recognize that people have problems. People are needing urgent assistance now. So despite all the support takes time, um, the countries are getting more sophisticated, both in the region um, covered by the commission and others. But activists are in need, and so I think that if decisions are going to be made, you know, I mean, I hate to say this, but you know, what's what's easier sometimes is if one forgets about the longer-term stuff, that's 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 fine. That's a missed opportunity. But at the same time, is recognizing that there's a new um, generation of electronic um, democracy activists that are needing a little bit more sophisticated type of support, and that should not be lost and that they need to be recognized, uh, they need to be supported, and the ideas need to come from them. Because at times, as uh, Rebecca mentioned, it wasn't the um, US activists, it was a Tunisian activist um, that's long been writing about these issues uh, that played a, a role in his own country and other countries in the region as well. I think we're talking about the, 
the difference between the urgent and the critically important. Uh, and so, um, you know, when we're talking about activists, it's right now, it's yesterday, and it's definitely tomorrow. Uh, and then when we're talking about solving these larger questions, we have to keep our eye on the ball and we have to engage it now because the problems that we're facing today and tomorrow will continue to be our problems today and tomorrow if we don't uh, develop those larger uh, answers to those larger questions that have been put by the panel here today. One, one thing just to, I mean, to, to come back to the, the urgent kind of today kind of thing. I mean, one, one of the things we did find in the Middle East with the internet kill switch being deployed in Egypt um, is the need for people to, you know, there are technologies out there actually to create sort of a combination of what Robert called sneaker net and people using kind of Bluetooth phones to sort of network locally with one another and the Bluetooth on their laptops and, and, and sort of send things amongst each other and then get it to the internet. You know, there, there are things like that, sort of hacks that could per perhaps, people could be better prepared for um, if, if 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 uh, if the tech technology is available, and so and those are some of the things that people are thinking about. But and there are locally adapted and adaptable solutions. So you do have some of the stronger tools that have received um, uh, investment and continue to grow, like the Tor project, which is which has widespread use. But you also have people, um, as Rebecca's saying, in these environments coming up with their own locally networked solutions. And mm -hmm. there are certainly people where those lessons could be shared internationally as well. Mesh networking, you know, is possibly an area to look at more closely uh, when we consider what happens when a, a government decides uh, to, to turn on the kill switch. As rare as it's been, uh, I don't necessarily think it's the last time it will happen. Uh, and as, as governments uh, play catch up with how the internet is controlled and how they control their telco environments, it is a tool that they can continue to use. Yeah, the discussion of the kill switch brings up a, a, a question that I wanted to, to raise, and, and that is um, something that your colleague, at, uh, when you were at the Berkman Center, Ethan Zuckerman, coined a wonderful phrase, the cute cat theory of digital activism. And it basically means that um, when you get to the point where there's so many people who are online looking at cute cat videos, you can't use the kill switch because so many people will turn into political activists that, because you've shut off their access to cute cats. Um, whereas if you're just deploying technologies that are just annoying dissidents, that's a price that, tag that you can afford, you know, as a country. So, you know, the question is how do we raise the price tag for, for these countries? You know, how do we make everybody a cute cut? <laughs> yeah, well, well, this is why Facebook and Twitter were so important in the Arab Spring, um, and, and it wasn't some, you know, government-funded application, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, that's exactly why. Um, because these, these tools are used every day for all kinds of non-political purposes, and that's how they spread, and that's why they became the place where you go when you want an audience for whatever it is you're doing. Um, and and so, I guess that's that's the point. I mean, there, there's some people in the activist community who are advocating, oh, you know, what we really need to do is develop these tools that are totally non-commercial and like, you know, they can't be controlled by any government and they can't be, you know, they have nothing to do with any company and that's where it's going to be totally free and, and that's the key to the future. Um, but again, the problem is you're not going to have any audience. Like if you're trying to run a political movement, that means you need to get beyond the hardcore dedicated people to the people who are normally blogging about their shoes that they bought at, you know, whatever boutique and cats and, you know, get them concerned. I mean, that's how you have a political movement. And you're going to find them on Facebook. You're not going to find them on some, you know, super cool dissident network. Um, and, and so, which is why bringing companies on board in terms of making sure that their networks do not get used as extensions of repressive power even if they didn't intend them to be and to ensure that you know vulnerable minorities and political activists are protected that their rights are protected within these networks while you know everybody is doing their cat blogging and you know dating and whatever else, I mean that's that's why it's so important to have the private sector on board um, with the understanding that they have a broader public responsibility, and that really the future democracy may depend on whether they step up. 
Right. And I think that's why when we're talking about this, we're talking about the digital economy. And the digital economy is the economy. And there isn't a country in the world today that doesn't have a stake in it. And that stake is growing and deepening as they strengthen and build out their networks so that every citizen in the world can have access to it. And I think while ever we understand that to be the case, we can recognise why it was that Egypt turned their internet back on as quickly as they did. You were no longer just talking about activists in Tahrir Square, you were talking about the entire economy being put on hold. And that's a tremendous disadvantage. That's an extraordinary decision for a government to take and one that I think is the, the, the least optimal but as Rebecca says, I think it's also one of the most important reasons why our engagement on this question has to include the business community. Um, I kind of see the QCAT theory a little bit different. Um, and I see it more that, that it's important to have conversations about non-controversial subjects first. Um, if you get the skills to exchange photos about cats, about babies, um, you just replace the, the picture of a cat with an activist, but it's the exact same skill. So building of skills and building a conversation and make it depoliticized, um, I think is particularly um, important. And countries that try to limit that are ones that we should single out. And a, a country in point uh, in, the, um, in, in Europe that's often talked about but has very draconian measures is Belarus. Belarus did not allow folks to assemble in its main square smiling. Um, people who are all smiling together got arrested. Uh, there was a flash mob that had people bring their ice cream combs together. They got arrested. And it's a country in the region that has incredibly draconian um, uh, internet control legislation as well that, if effective, will spread to that region as well, too. So, you know, it, it is um, countries that, that aren't pushed back and it's very difficult and supporting and monitoring that the technology flows. I think that's the other issues is what the activists do, but also if countries are supporting other countries, the worst practices are being spread uh, in different regions. And if the U.S. has an influence, it can try, um, uh, that's why I mentioned, you know, stopping the technology flows or at least knowing where they're going are particularly important. Um, and there are a variety of different instruments that don't have to be created or existing ones that, that can be used, but just updated uh, to have some of that. So it's, um, I think, keeping it simple, having people being able to have access to the Internet if they don't have it at all. So the U.S. can encourage the Internet being deployed, but not a re-engineered Internet that's one of control, but that's one that's increasingly being found in, in Africa, supported by the Chinese. Okay, I've got one more question for the panel before I open it up to the audience, and that's um, you were talking about the the, the necessity of, of having conversations online, and 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 one of the um, I was reading an article by Clay Sharkey, who's a um, a professor um, who's written a lot on internet issues, but and he's arguing that access to information is less important politically than access to conversation. I mean, the other way around. Um, and that conversation itself is really important. And, and I agree with that, but I think um, it ignores this growing phenomenon of control of the conversation and where um, China, uh, Russia, uh, other countries are actually deploying people to have the conversation in a really artificial manner <laughs> or in paying people to do the conversation. And so when you distort what is supposed to be this free flow of dialogue and among friends or acquaintances on the internet to become um, really what is propaganda, you know, what, what, are, what, what do we do about that? It's there, it's information, it's free flow of information, but it's not necessarily um, free information. Uh, what sort of um, responses can we have to that? Yeah, well, there's, a, there's another academic, I won't get too far into academic wonkery, um, who talks about something called authoritarian deliberation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things, I think, in the reporting on a lot of authoritarian countries and the Internet is, is that, you know, if there's a, a lot of public debate about issues, that's seen as, oh, well, then that country must be liberalizing and it must be on its way to democracy. Mm -hmm. But what we're actually seeing is that um, a government like China, but there are others like Bahrain comes to mind and, and, and a number of other uh, places where 
exactly that. You, you have quite a lot of discourse going on. You have tremendously lively conversation, but it's constrained within certain boundaries um, and also very manipulated by people who, some people who are paid by the government, other people who are just kind of, in, you know, all the, the nationalistic people are encouraged to do whatever they want and nobody, no consequence, and the liberal internationalists, you know, have consequences and get censored, so it's manipulated uh, in a particular direction. And, and it's, it's hard, you know, because, you know, there's no app to deal with that, right? Um, but at least in China, but I, I think also in, in other countries, um, again, it, it comes back, it, it goes away from the technology and comes back to human community. And in China, one reason why the government, I think, has been so effective in maintaining control while still having a very lively internet um, is that they've marginalized this liberal blogger community. You know, they, they've got just the, the amount of space they have to talk the ability to converse is more and more squeezed, more and more people are threatened, and so on. And, and the rest of the country has no idea that these people even exist. Um, so part of it might be, um, you know, just helping to create alternative spaces for these communities where, you know, some other place for them to go online outside of their national cyberspace where they can be safe and have their conversations and maybe build critical mass so that, maybe more people in their country might want to join those conversations. And, and Twitter has actually had something of that effect in China in that there's, you know, th it's known as the place where you go when you want to have uncensored conversations in China. It's getting harder to access, but, and it's getting more surveilled, so, so that kind of window has, is also closing. But, but there's a community of people who found that to be a safe space for a while. Uh, and, and so I think part of it may be just helping to create, if people cannot create spaces for communities of conversation on their own or in their own countries, are there ways to help support those conversations and communities, um, you know, digitally elsewhere? But it's, it's difficult. I'll, I'll just say and the simplest is in, in those cases is just making sure that the, the activists in these particular countries um, that are subject to, in a way to cyberbullying because they have all these people posting hundreds of paid blogs that they be recognized. Um, so whether it's Oleg Kovslovsky in, in Russia or others, um, very valiant young people in Belarus um, and, and other countries as well that when they're facing great threat. Um, they need to be recognized and for them the best thing is to know that they're not alone then they'll keep the struggle and they'll they'll brush off all the comments but you know a lot of young people which are you know the vast majority of the people online don't have these very basic skills of defending against criticisms take see it personally and just turn off and so it's old tech it's old support but equally as important mm -hmm. And, you know, a, a last shout out for education. It's just absolutely critical that people, you know, know how to use their internet well and, and have a level of sophistication and knowledge about what it is. And um, I, I think that that's especially so for, for civic activists who are feeling very alone, but it's also um, the community writ large. And, you know, we, we have um, an absence of information in this space, um, which is, and it's a very contested space. And in the competition for ideas, we have to somehow make make it uh, some of the fundamentals truly and obviously available to everybody, and I, I don't think we've been able to do that fully yet. And I think that um, you know uh, we've been surprised. I think Western governments have been deeply surprised um, at, at how contested those basics are in terms of that education. And I, I think that we have a long way to go. Are there any questions from the audience? Anybody who'd like to? Um Ask the panelists. Um, yeah, just if you could step up to the mic here. You, you were first. That's fine. <laughs> and uh, if you could just tell us your name and affiliation, that'd be great. Thanks. My name is Patrick McKay. I'm an intern with the Center for Democracy and Technology. And my question is kind of a follow-up to what uh, Rebecca was saying about domestic threats 
to internet freedom. And uh, my question concerns a bill that was just introduced in the last week by Senator Leahy, uh, the Protect IP Act, um, <laughs> which many groups have expressed concerns would establish a similar U.S. censorship regi regime by, in the name of protecting intellectual property, uh, it would for the first time employ tools um, such as domain name blocking and um, internet search engine censorship or search results censorship on a wide scale within the United States. And I was just wondering if the panel um, could discuss um, any concerns you may have with that, especially in regard to undermining U.S. ability to influence uh, the rest of the world in a positive direction for internet freedom. Um, well, a, a couple of things. I mean, I'm, I'm quite concerned about that bill for the same reasons you are. Um, I would, just with one caveat, just emphasize, however, that I'm not equating the United States and China. Uh, the, there are a number of key differences, one being that I'm standing here today saying critical things and I'm not going to jail later. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's, that's a really big difference. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and the fact that we can share information, we can discuss, we can rally, we can debate, we can lobby to have laws change that we don't like and we don't go to jail for doing that. And there are bloggers who are, you know, uh, being very outspoken about this all the time, but that organizations like yours can actually exist. You know, that's like in China, they couldn't. Um, so, but, so there are a lot of really key differences. So I just want to get that out of the way so that nobody accuses me of saying that the U.S. and China are somehow equal um, or, or remotely equal. But um, that said, there is a dangerous erosion of due process and accountability um, in a lot of proposed legislation and also some legislative trends, uh, administrative trends um, over the past decade uh, that are of great concern. And uh, a lot of delegation of policing to private networks, the, the, the lack of clarity about what information is being shared with various government agencies and how uh, the, you know, the, the fact that content might be taken down uh, due to a fairly specious accusation of copyright violation that ends up not being true, but in the meantime, the critical period of time for your activism has passed, and you know the extent to which there's enough due process and accountability when it comes to manipulation of speech, I think remains a concern. And um, you know, we are a robust democracy, but democracy is like a marriage. If you take it for granted, you're gonna wake up one day and discover you don't have it anymore. Uh, and in the internet age, I think we're at this critical point where we really need to be looking at how are we balancing these various policy interests and policy aims, um, including defense, law enforcement, IP protection and so forth, and make sure that we are defending civil liberties and freedom of expression as robustly in digital spaces as we have always defended them in our physical spaces. And what I'm concerned is that there are a lot of policymakers who see the cyber realm as a place where you don't have to have trade-offs, where you ought to be able to have perfect security, or you ought to be able to have you know, no more copyright violation at all. Um, and it's just like, well, yeah, we could have a crime-free Washington, D.C., but at what cost um, in, a, in our physical space? And, and so I think the point being is, is that we're going to have to have balance and trade-offs. You're not going to have perfect security. You're, you know, it's, it's human solutions to human problems. And uh, I, I think sometimes that there's to a lot of policymakers, lawmakers have pressure from their constituencies to just make certain problems go away. And just as in the physical world, we can't make most problems go away completely. It, we're not going to be able to make them disappear completely in the digital realm uh, unless you want to ruin democracy. Um, I'll, a slightly different set of points is that you know there seems to have been a variety of proposed legislation around kind of copyright really trying to restrict access. We haven't seen the same number of legislation to try to protect um, 
the space of the Internet in other countries. We've had GOFA, we have Durban in the Senate that's proposing something, and then we have a plethora of other type of restrictive legislation. So there needs to be legislation that also promotes um, kind of speech online as well, too. Um, you know, what I'll say is dangerous from, if you take a look at kind of trends in the past, is, um, you know, while I personally may have one view or another on the copyright discussion and whether it's gone too far or, or it hasn't, what's important is that there is a whole industry that's developed that take technology policy embedded into technology. And so the, the device itself is the one that does all the uh, deciding. Um, so we do, we, this is what the deep packet inspection technology was all about, to try to take a look at if BitTorrent was being streamed or other things were being streamed and stop it. That technology gets developed here. For the legislation that people may or may not disagree with, but that gets implemented here, that piece of technology finds its way into other countries and all the due process is turned off. And so my worry is with the technology that gets developed to implement technology choices made here at home have an incredible effect in repressing free speech and, and, and surveillance abroad. And we need to make sure that that unintended consequence gets controlled in somehow because otherwise that's that's what we're creating. We're creating the monster and let's not forget that the legislation created by Congress to support schools many years ago with internet access also added provisions around pornography in schools and everyone may find that fine but there was a whole industry that spawned to um, make sure that censorship was available and then that found its way around the world and so for everything that we do there's an international implication and you know at least we're not tracking that enough and so that's maybe something that we can do and then the technology policies we make at home stay at home then it wouldn't be as bad it won't be as easy but it's at least to limit the damage that we might have mm -hmm. Did you want to say anything? Or you... I think we recognise that lawmaking around the internet, whatever the subject, is extremely hard. It's amongst the most complex because it has to consider so many variables. And I think that we can only urge um, our lawmakers and the best of our decision makers and those who are trying to help frame this going forward uh, to bring the right people to the table to make sure they're as, as informed as possible of the unintended consequences and the possibilities uh, so that there's a more measured and balanced approach to these. It's not that we don't believe in solving these problems, it's that we don't have an easy outlook on what the consequences of those decisions are and so that's why it involves often an unusual array or cast of characters around the table, but I think increasingly we have to be able to speak across the bow to different industries and across different groupings in order to be able to solve them. You had a, you had a question? If you go ahead. Yeah. Um, where do we start? I mean, I'm not expecting lawmakers to jump for joy at the prospect of a bunch of slides on crypto cryptographic key exchanges <laughs> or anything like that, but a lot of legislation um, obviously shows the hallmarks of ignorance about technology. Um, whether it's the situation surrounding circumvention tools, that people want to hear that someone's going to single-handedly take down a great firewall in between World of Warcraft games, instead of having a bunch of geeks do long-term research, trying to anticipate, trying to be five, ten steps ahead of what the sensors are going to be doing, while sustaining uh, the tools that exist, it's boring stuff. Um, and, but if you're going to legislate in this arena... Congress does boring really well. <laughs> I, but it, it's, it's a different kind of boring. It, I mean, I, I've read legislation, but this is a different flavor of boring. Um, where do we start? Um, we're willing uh, to talk, but the reception is not, not there, at least in my experience, to, to understand the technology before legislating. And, and could you just tell us your name and your affiliation? Oh, I'm Karen Riley from the Tor Project. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, I think that's a great question. And it, it also kind of plays into a question that I wanted the panelists to weigh in on is like, what's the fourth generation? I mean, what are we, what are we looking at on the horizon for next? You know, and, and what should we be focusing our attention on? And I think that's a great question. Um, it's, a, it's a variety of different things. I think that I wouldn't say necessarily fourth generation, but developments that we're seeing is that we're seeing um, governments that want to be supportive, like the U.S., 
um, having a variety of different priorities that they need to uh, try to solve. And so you have, you know, what's considered by some, you know, quite high levels of support around kind of internet freedom. Uh, it's one of the few areas in the FY11 budget that kept, it's, it's mm -hmm. more or less its levels that it did before, didn't have much of a cut. Um, but it won't be able to do it for um, forever. Um, and other countries need to pitch in. And so seeing that the shift to a more international scope, I think, is particularly important. And, and you know, I think that's something that hopefully we'll see over the next um, probably six months or so, other, com uh, other countries coming in. Um, I think what I was talking in terms of the third generation, in terms of there's a whole industry. And I think what risk we have is that despite all the great efforts that, that we all have, um, is that there will be something that changes the game, that resets um, all the measures that we've done. Um, you could think about it as there was conventional warfare during World War II and there, there was the atomic bomb and it changed. Um, I think that something like malware will, will change that for, for cybersecurity because um, fractioning of the, of the DNS, which is the uh, system we all use that everything uniquely identifies through a system coordinated by ICANN, if that fractures, um, that's a problem. And so um, if the governance of the Internet fractures, we have a completely different world. Yeah, I'm a relative newcomer to Washington, and, and so the, the, the ways things work in these halls is, continues to be something of a mystery to me. Um, uh, but, yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, politics ultimately is all about constituencies, and I think part of the problem, I mean, there, there are so many different problems, but one of, the, one of the problems is that the policy is really just being discussed amongst a fairly narrow group of people, and I think we just need much broader public concern as well. You know, on the one hand, you need better technical knowledge in in crafting legislation. I think on the other hand, you need a much bigger movement. Um, and it, it, again, I tend to look more at the long game because that's sort of where my head is and other people are looking more at the short game. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I think just in terms of where the internet is going, whether it's going to main, maintain its open and free nature, you really need a global movement of people who are pushing for its protection, kind of like you have an environmental movement. And you need people asking their Congress, congressmen and women, you know, in that cybersecurity bill or in that IP protection bill, are you also making sure that my civil liberties are protected? you know, asking those questions. And I don't think legislators are getting enough questions of that kind from their constituents. I don't think companies are getting enough uh, questions of those kinds from their users and customers. Um, I would like to see a lot more kind of demand for transparency um, on the part of companies in, in terms of how they're handling information and in terms of, you know, what the government accesses and how and when and how those processes work. Um, in addition, you know, there, there, there are a lot of things, I think, around the public needing to demand uh, more sensible and balanced legislation, kind of understanding, you know, I mean, it took a few decades for the public to realize, or at least some critical mass of the public, that, you know, uh, companies needed to be held responsible and that there should be a way to do it and to get legislators on board in a more holistic way. And it's still really hard every step of the way um, with environmental issues. But we're, we're sort of like back in the 60s, you know, as far as the internet kind of freedom movement is concerned, you know, <laughs> still, you know, we haven't even hit Earth Day yet in, in terms of awareness. Um, and, but it needs to get there somehow, and, and that might help. I mean, it's obviously we're never going to solve the problem, right? I mean, we're human beings, but which means, you know, it's always going to be a mess. But um, I, I think definitely just people recognizing that the Internet is a politically contested space and recognizing that they are citizens of that space and they need to push for their rights and demand their rights be protected in that space 
uh, and that whether the rights of a person in China are protected in, in that space could ultimately affect whether our rights are protected, you know, because it's globally one, you know, potentially one space. That that's, people aren't thinking of the internet and our technology that way. And I think the more people begin to think of it that way, there may be more pressure on lawmakers in all democracies to think more broadly about the longer term consequences when they're trying to solve very specific problems. All right, we have time for one more question. If, if there's anyone else who'd like to, to ask any questions. Nope. Okay. Well, I want to um, just close by um, telling you that in the RAND study, they actually did say that there is a tipping point, you know, where, um, you know, the, that dictators can have, you know, a little too much democracy for, for their taste and that it could lead to more democratic societies. Um, but I would really like to ask those authors to, to redo that study, um, given everything that we've seen today and the way that countries have, and governments have responded to the internet, um, I think they've been quite agile and, and creative and a lot more than, than I think that we considered before. And I, I wanted to close with a quote that was in the study um, by Aldous Huxley, who is a, you know, an author um, who wrote a lot about the future, but um, he wrote that mass communication in a word is neither good nor bad, it is simply a force. And like any other force, it can be used either well or ill. Used in one way, the press, the radio, and the cinema are indispensable to the survival of democracy. Used in another way, they are among the most powerful weapons in the dictator's armory. And that was from 1958. Um, I think the same quote could be said today about the technologies that we have. And I think it just outlines for us what the real challenges we're facing and, and um, that we're going to continue to face as we try to do this. And I appreciate your interest in this issue. And I hope that we'll see you again at another event. Thanks. Thank you. Having a dialogue, having briefings are helpful.